Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to, um, to use trigonometry to represent uh, complex numbers. Basically, um, it's quite an interesting topic because it actually combines together um, many different uh, um, topics in, in mathematics. And uh, for me personally, it was really like one of the manifestations of the beauty of mathematics. So it's not just, you know, memorization of formulas, etc. So on the website, unizor.com, I decided to put together this um, kind of a combined picture of three different um, areas, three different fields in mathematics. Trigonometry, complex numbers, and geometry. And um, let me, just to whet your appetite, let me write the formula which would be kind of uh, the quintessential formula which represents this type of a synergy between these three uh, different fields in mathematics. This is called the Euler's formula. Euler is the mathematician. Um, he is a Swiss mathematician who worked almost all his life in Russia in, uh, I think it's 18th century. So that's his formula. You see, it combines together so many different things, uh, which uh, it, it's kind of hard to believe that you can combine them in one formula. First of all, there is an exponential function, but there is an i uh, in the exponent, which is a complex number, it's an imaginary number, so it goes to a, a, a number theorist in complex number theories and then you have trigonometric functions here and the canonical representation of the real part and and the imaginary part of the um, uh, complex number so it looks like we can actually use um, the exponential function to uh, with with, uh, with complex um, exponent which we never addressed before um, so, and as far as geometry is concerned, all I can say is that if x is changing, then the geometrical representation of this is a circle. So this is a circle, and this is a circle, if x is changing. So all these pieces together uh, will be combined in the proper order, and my lecture right now is just the first lecture, which is supposed to basically introduce you to representation of this type and eventually we will derive the Euler formula as well. All right, so um, let me just um, repeat my usual introduction that it's better to um, uh, watch this lecture on unizor.com website. Um, uh, it's part of the trigonometry, the representation of the um, complex numbers in trigonometry um, just because this website has uh, not only the lecture itself, the video, reference to the video, uh, but also notes which basically can be considered as a textbook and uh, I usually put lots of problems maybe um, not for every topic but in any case it's basically an educational website which presents you an advanced um, mathematics for high school students. All right, now, so let me just start with um, this particular trigonometric representation of uh, complex numbers. First of all, complex numbers is something which I have already addressed before um, uh, in, in the, um, the course of algebra, uh, and I do suggest you to refresh it. I mean, if you don't remember what complex numbers are or what I actually is or something like this, so you better refer to these lectures and refresh your memory. So I will assume that whatever is necessary from the complex numbers, you know. Now, the complex numbers um, are, in general, can be represented as this, where A and B are real numbers. I is an imaginary unit which has the property of this. Its square is equal to minus 1. That's basically how we introduced the complex numbers. We could not 
extract the square root of minus 1 or any other negative number and this actually helps us because now we can say that square root of minus i is equal to uh, of minus 1 is equal to i actually minus i or plus i all right so um, this is a canonical traditional uh, representation of the complex numbers now next is the graphical representation now the graphical representation is very simple if we have two axes we can put one real number the real the, the real part of the complex number on as as the abscissa and uh, another as a as an ordinate and this point is a graphical representation of this number so we assume that uh, the unit of measurement along the horizontal x-axis is just one and the unit of measurement along the uh, y-axis is i so i have a units along the real uh, axis and b units along the imaginary axis and a b is the point which um, which represents my uh, complex number in Cartesian coordinates. Now, let's now think about the coordinates and the plane and geometry of this thing. Now, you know that not only the Cartesian coordinates can be used on the plane, but also polar coordinates. Now, what is polar in this particular case? Well, there's also two parameters. One being the magnitude and another being an angle. So this is called um, the magnitude or modulus or absolute value of the complex number z and uh, the angle phi um, is called argument or a phase or just a polar angle. So basically in this particular case now um, using the trigonometry uh, in this right triangle we can say that a is equal to r multiplied by cosine of phi right r times cosine phi plus i r and the b is obviously r which is a hypotenuse multiplied by a sine of phi so this is another representation of this uh, complex number z or you can actually factor out r I'm using two different r's um, cosine phi plus i sine phi alright that's another representation so we have right now algebraic traditional uh, canonical representation we have geometric representation in Cartesian coordinates and we have a geometrical representation in polar coordinates which leads us to trigonometric representation of the complex numbers so again two parameters now what's good and what's bad with these two different representations the uh, uh, canonical representation and the trigonometric representation all right um, here is a very simple uh, thing you can very easily add two numbers in both systems namely if you have z1 equal to a1 plus ib1 and z2 equals to a2 plus ib2 two numbers sum is very easy to calculate in this representation right how about the product 
Multiplication is a little bit more involved. Okay, let's multiply them. Well, um, it's A1 times A2. plus A1 times B2 and I uh, A2 B1 I and I square B1 B2 equals now I square as we know is minus 1 so this is minus 1 times B1 B2 so the real part is a1 a2 minus b1 b2 the real part of this product and the imaginary part is a1 b2 plus a2 b1 well i'm not i'm not saying it's a complex formula but it's a little bit involved let's do it in polar coordinates So this is Z1, and Z2 is equal to R2 cosine phi 2 phi 2 plus I sine phi 2. Now let's multiply them. It seems to be a little bit more complex, but it's not the case. It's actually simpler. All right, let's follow. Well, obviously, you have to multiply the magnitudes. And whatever will be in the parentheses is cosine times cosine, cosine phi, cosine phi 2, plus I cosine phi 1, uh, sorry, sine phi 2 plus i sine phi 1 cosine phi 2 and plus i square sine phi 1 sine phi 2 equals r1 r2 again i square is minus 1 now cosine phi 1 cosine phi 2 minus sine phi 1 sine phi, phi phi 2 what is it that's what it is i times cosine phi 1 sine phi 2 sine phi 1 cosine phi 2 what is it we know this is So, what's interesting about this? Whenever I'm multiplying two complex numbers in their polar form, well, magnitudes are multiplied, that's obvious. Uh, what's interesting about the angles, angles are added together. It's really quite a remarkable thing. What does it mean geometrically? Here's what I suggest you to do. Let's have a unit circle and let's have only uh, complex numbers on this unit circle. Now, what are these complex numbers? Well, obviously, these are complex numbers uh, with magnitude equals to 1. Now, angle can be different. This is phi 1 and this is z1. And this is, let's say, phi 2 and this is z2 so r1 and r2 both are equal to 1 because they're all on the unit circle now what are we saying right now that multiplying one by another is actually a rotation so to multiply z1 with phi 1 as a uh, as a face as, a, as, as an argument 
to multiply it by z2, which has phi2 as, as an argument, it's actually a rotation because we have to have a sum of these two angles and that's what will be my z1 times z2 and the angle the angle would be phi1 plus phi2 that's what's interesting so in the polar form multiplication of the complex numbers actually is a rotation now, as far as the magnitudes, magnitudes are multiplied, right? So it's a stretching, so to speak. So first you have to rotate one complex number by the angle which is the phase of another, the argument of another complex number. But as far as the magnitude of the new of the product, it's just the product of two magnitudes, which means it's just stretching or, 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 or squeezing, whatever. But if both of them have the same magnitude equal to 1, then it's just rotation, right? Okay, now, um, just as an example, um, let me um, just have a couple of cases first of all, if you have real numbers Real numbers are those numbers where v is equal to zero, right? Or, if you wish, in the polar form, um, that's where sine is equal to zero. So, what's the argument, what's the phase? When sine is equal to zero, it means that the angle is either equal to zero so it's all the points here, or angle equals to pi, which is all the points here. So obviously, on, on the plane where my um, complex numbers are represented as points, the numbers on the x-axis represent the um, real numbers, because the imaginary part is equal to zero. Now, what if I would like to multiply any complex number z by some real number? Well, let's just think about it. Real number has the uh, magnitude equals to its absolute value. And the phase angle is equal to either 0 or pi. So what does it mean? Well, let's consider the positive direction. If you're multiplying a complex number by a positive number r, so what we are saying is that the magnitudes are multiplied, so it's basically stretched r times. And as far as the angles are concerned, I have to rotate by the angle of this guy but this angle is equal to zero so there is no rotation so basically this point let's say r is equal to uh, three so this point is three times further from the from the origin of coordinates but it's on the same on the same line all right now what if r is negative let's say, let's say it's minus three well again we are stretching three times because the magnitude is equal to three but then we are turning by 180 degree by pi so it goes this way, actually, the point. So it's uh, symmetrically uh, transferred around the point zero and stretched, in this case, three times. So that's what multiplication by real number is. You are still remaining on this line, plus or minus, I mean, into one direction where it was before or the opposite direction, and you're stretching by the number, which is your real number you're multiplying by. Okay. Well, in particular, if you're multiplying by 1, obviously, it stays the same. Because the mag magnitude is not changed, and the angle is not changed. All right. So, what if you are multiplying by i? That's another example. So, let's say you have z1, whatever angles are, 
and z2 is equal to i. Now what i is? Well, i is cosine uh, of pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2, right? Because the cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so i is represented in the polar form as this one, and it has a magnitude of 1, right? So when I'm multiplying, magnitudes are multiplied, which means magnitude remains the same, and angles are added. So basically, if I want to, if this is my z, I want to basically rotate it by pi over 2. So it will be this one. This is z2, z1 times z2, when z2 is equal to i. So multiplication by i geometrically means just turning to a perpendicular direction by 90 degrees. Okay? All right, so basically what have we combined together? We combined complex numbers, trigonometry, and geometry, and represented our complex numbers in this polar, in this polar form. This is just an introduction to whatever this Euler's formula, which I have written in the beginning as your, to whet your appetite, basically. So this is the first step. So now we know how to represent complex numbers. Okay, so please refer to unizor.com, um, go to the same lecture again and uh, read the notes. They are like your textbook, basically, so you can learn again or refresh your memory. And um, one more thing, uh, I if you did not refresh your uh, knowledge about complex numbers before this lecture, try to do it again right now and then read the uh, notes for this lecture at unizor.com. And obviously I do suggest you to um, enroll into um, the website because if you enroll then you can actually take exams and uh, um, have some self-study programs, etc. Very beneficial for you. Thanks very much and good luck.